demo. We're going to talk about the difference between having a live stream video versus a pre-recorded one. I'm going to show you guys exactly step by step how I physically set up to do my art demos, how to do an art demo that has more than one camera view, equipment options. I'm going to tell you guys what you absolutely must have, what is really great to have, and the stuff that's icing on the cake but can really make your life a little bit easier. We're also going to talk about common problems because actually that is the thing that I think is the most tricky about teaching art online is how to troubleshoot all of those technical issues. And I have figured a lot of them out. So like I said, I'm gonna save you guys five years of grief. We're gonna talk about free streaming software, free streaming platforms, because there are many different options. And I'm also gonna show you guys how to customize video layouts that you can then save and use for the future. In case you guys have never been here before, our main site is artprof.org and our content is 100% free. We don't have any type of paywall. We rely entirely on donations. And we do have a new section on artprof.org called Teaching and Learning Art Online. And we created this section as a response to the global pandemic. So what we did is we actually pivoted a lot of our content towards topics that teachers and students needed. So we have videos like ways to critique art online, mistakes to avoid, actually tips from students that I used myself in my classroom this past spring with a lot of my students. We also have this gigantic chart of home art supplies because you know what? We can't get to the art store anymore, it's tricky. So go into your backyard, open up your kitchen cupboard, we got a huge directory of art prompts, all of which have been custom tailored to fit the home art supply list that we talked about earlier. So anyway, get a cup of coffee, settle in. And also, if you have not attended a live stream before, you guys will notice on the right of the video, there is a live chat. So you can type in any questions, any comments, I will do the absolute best I can to get to everybody's questions. And I will stop the lecture every now and then so I can take a look at that. So if I don't get your question right away, it's not because I don't want to answer it. It's just because there's probably other stuff going on and I will do the absolute best I can. Okay, now before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of how all of this works, I have to explain to you guys really the two options for video when you teach online. And people are using this word synchronous. To me, that just means live and asynchronous, which to me is pre-recorded. Use whatever words you want, but if I can use fewer syllables, I will. So I'm gonna to refer to these as live video and pre-recorded, just so we are all on the same page. Now, here's the thing. I have been doing a lot of lurking in the art teacher Facebook groups because I get tons of cool ideas and I really get a sense of what people's needs are. And I do feel one thing that I have gotten a sense for is what most people are doing. And so I wanna talk about that. But before I get into that, tell me in the chat, are you an art teacher? Did I pull you over here from one of the art teacher Facebook groups and tell me what grade you teach, if it's college, tell me about what your experience has been like online and I will do the best I can to get to that. But I'd love to hear who's a teacher right now. I mean, the rest of you guys are fabulous. Don't get me wrong. I love you guys too. But I'm just curious to know who here really is going to be implementing some of this stuff into your classrooms in the fall. Christian is asking, will this be recorded and available? Yes, it will. So this will be live for a little bit. It takes about a half an hour for the video to process. And then after that, it will be available anytime you guys want on our YouTube channel. Okay, so here is what I am seeing people doing pretty much across the board in a lot of the online demos. Most people are pre-recording them. I know very few people who are doing them live. And the people who are doing them live, a lot of you are doing it on Zoom, which is not a good idea. It's there's a lot of reasons why, and I will get into it. But basically, the people who are doing pre-recorded videos, it's usually video 
the people are shooting separate from the audio. So usually there's like an overhead view, like the hands shot that you're seeing here. And then people record a voiceover and then they edit the voiceover over the video. Now, if you think about that, that is a way to shoot an online tutorial, but it's nothing remotely close to an in-person demo. It's very artificial. And so I think what I'm seeing here is that so many things are getting severely lost in translation, because if you really are truly trying to get as close as you possibly can to an in-person demonstration, which I think that's what we are all hoping to do, even though it's not the same thing, this version of the pre-recorded video, not even close. And trust me, guys, you can get a lot closer to real life than this, okay? Because th this is not close at all. So I really, really recommend you guys, you not do this version, okay? Because how many of us teach like this in the classroom? We don't, we show up, we talk, we show things, we talk and we do things at the same time. None of this voiceover over the hands making something, not gonna work so well, guys. Okay. Somebody is saying in the chat, a Frez says, usually I'm doing a time lapse after I've explained what I'm going to do. I do see a lot of people doing time lapse, but I'll tell you, I have some issues with the time lapse. For one thing, again, it's an artificial experience. I cannot do a time lapse when I'm in the classroom in real life. And so to me, why would you wanna do that in a class that is supposed to be in person? And the thing is for me, the beauty of real life teaching is literally talking and doing things at the same time in real time. And so if you speed things up or you record an audio voiceover later on and you smash it together with some video, it's not good guys, it's not close, okay? So here's another thing. If you do live video, there's no editing, okay? And yes, I know people will say things like, oh, well, it's no problem. I use iMovie. It doesn't take that long. It takes time once you've had to do more than a couple of demos. And if you can avoid editing, I would. Trust me, I am the biggest fan of editing, okay? We have tons of tutorials here at ArtProf that I spend hours and hours and hours editing to death. And those are extremely time consuming, but it's a different beast. This is not what remote learning should look like. This is if you have a YouTube channel and you're making videos, it's not the same thing. So I think the important thing to understand here is that people are making videos for very different purposes. And if you're a brick and mortar teacher who is now being forced to make this transition to online teaching, you're not a YouTuber with tutorials. It's not the same thing at all. Miss Anita says, I'm an international teacher, but will not be going overseas for fall because of COVID. I'm interested in learning how to teach online professionally. Okay, well, this will definitely give you lots of tips because there's certainly a lot of crossover between somebody who wants to say, have a YouTube channel versus somebody who really is just transitioning temporarily because of COVID, okay? Now, here's the thing, guys. The most compelling thing to me about live video is that it guarantees that students will watch the entire video, mostly, and it encourages interaction. Because the thing about pre-recorded video, guys, okay, and those of you who are high school students and college students, back me up here, because uh, some of us old farts don't really wanna believe it until we actually hear it from the younger people. Student watching habits for pre-recorded videos Oh my goodness, I am just astounded at how the younger generation watches videos. It's not like we do. Anybody over the age of 40 has a completely different set of video watching habits. And you know how I know this? Because I have a 13 year old and she did remote learning this past semester. And th these are the things that she did. When she watched the video, she never watched the whole thing. She always skimmed it, just little bits at a time. And you know something else? A lot of you guys don't even watch the beginning of the video first. I have watched students click on the last minute in the video. And I would say to them, why are you guys clicking on the last minute? That's really weird. They're like, oh, I wanna know what I'm gonna get out of the video. 
And I was like, you're kidding. They're like, yeah. So sometimes I wouldn't even watch the beginning. And so <laughs> as teachers, I think a lot of us think, oh, well, if it's important, we should put it at the beginning. Actually, no, <laughs> that's pretty much a guarantee that none of them are going to watch it. Number two, this I also learned too. Thank you so much, Art Prof interns. Students speed up the video when they watch it. Like I didn't even know this was a setting on YouTube that you can watch a video at one and a half times the speed, at double the speed. And so they're watching a video and it's like the person's like talking like this and this is what the chores looks like. And they're just like, that is not a good experience. But students do that because they get impatient and they don't want to have to listen to the whole thing, which takes so long. And then they only watch little pieces in the end. So in my opinion, if you look at the difference, and I'm going to show you some more examples between the experience of a student watching a live video versus a pre-recorded video, I will take the live video any day of the week because a pre-recorded video, the likeliness and the amount of information that the students are going to get from that experience, it's so much lower than on a live video. Heidi says, my students definitely don't want to watch long videos either. How do you keep them short without time lapse and editing? You do them live, that's what you do. Because if a video is live, you guys can't speed me up, okay? You can't jump ahead because it's a live video. And what you can do is let's say your class meets Fridays at eight o'clock, you say, I'm gonna do the live stream. And if you guys want, you can certainly make the video available afterwards. I would do that because I think that's smart. But if you really <laughs> wanna be a tough teacher, you cannot make it available afterwards. And then the only option for them is to actually show up. So it's up to you guys how you actually want to configure that. But I think that's an important thing to consider. Yeah, like Neil was saying in the chat, I watch pre-recorded videos double the speed. They're too slow. And yeah, this is all true, you guys. So th this is like news for everybody over the age of 40. We have no idea. The only reason I know is because I get the inside scoop from my art prof interns who are very happy to educate me on the ways of younger people. Okay, so here is what I am gonna really push in this demo is streaming live using OBS, which is open broadcaster software and then streaming into a YouTube channel. Now, there are many, many other ways to do it. There are variations on this. This is one way and hopefully it's enough just to get you guys going and thinking about, okay, well, how can I really custom tailor this? Because again, depending on what grade level you're teaching and what your school is doing, these may not be options for you. They probably are options for a lot of you. So I don't know, but what I'm saying is this is what I'm gonna recommend. And Heidi says, suggestions for those who are locked into asynchronous classes at this point for the fall. Well, in that case, there's definitely ways that you can sustain their attention in the videos because I think that, well, here's the thing. Well, let's get to this later, actually, Heidi, because I have this embedded in the lecture later on. So let's wait till I get to that topic, but I will get there at a certain point. So OBS is basically free software and that's where you customize everything. That's where you can put in different camera angles, different graphics. And what you do is you connect it to your YouTube channel and then it goes right through that way. So that's the basics. And I will go over all into the specifics later on. Maria is saying, what do you think of pre-recorded videos that are pre-recorded, have a live chat when it plays? Oh, you're talking about premiered videos. I don't think for teachers that's so necessary. So what Maria's talking about is, well, I don't know. Now that you bring it up and I'm thinking about it for more than half a second, that might actually be a good idea. Okay, let me explain. For those of you guys who don't know what a video premiere is, that's basically where you take a pre-recorded video file and you schedule it to premiere at a certain time on your channel. And as it premieres, it's like, a as you watch it, you can't speed up and you can't jump ahead because it's a premiere. That is brilliant. I'm such a moron for telling you that wasn't a good idea three seconds ago. Okay, well, I'm definitely gonna write that down as an option. A video premiere on YouTube might actually work out really, really well. Okay, so let's work at all. Zoom is not a platform that is made to stream live video. YouTube and OBS are set up for that. 
And so one of the biggest complaints I got from students about all of these Zoom calls and everything was the lag. And students complained to me that, oh, the teachers are trying to do these demos, they're trying to play videos, my inner connection's really bad. With YouTube Live, it's not a problem because the software is actually set up to handle different amounts of people chatting and speaking live. So really, really important. Yeah, and Josh is not an artist, is saying for premiere videos on YouTube, you can also hang out in the chat and answer student questions. That is brilliant. Thank you so much, Maria Rev. You guys are fabulous. Afraz is saying, what camera are you using, GoPro or camera? I'm going to get into that. I have so many slides about all the equipment to show you guys. Now, the cool thing about OBS is that you can create and save customized layouts. So when I sit down and I'm like, I want to record a lecture, I want to record a demo, I just click that scene and it pops up and I don't have to do anything else. So yes, in the beginning, it is a lot of setup because you have to get all your templates and layouts set up. But once I have it set up, some of you guys who have watched our videos before, I can switch between layouts with just one click. So it's really incredible how simple it is once you actually get things up and running. So here are a couple things that are the advantages of live video. And you guys are using this right now, which is the live chat on the right hand side. I think this is fantastic because I know for a lot of students, they had a lot of pressure from teachers over the past semester to be on video during a Zoom call. And I understand why, because I know for teachers, from our point of view, we want to make sure students are there. We want to make sure that they are paying attention. But you know what? They're not. Guys, I'm sorry to tell you about this, teachers, but, and high school students, back me up here, they're not paying attention. You might think that they are. They're playing video games. They're watching Netflix. They are texting their friends. Just because a student is on video on Zoom, it doesn't mean anything. And so in my opinion, make it easier and just take all the students off video and just have them in the chat. It's so much better for everybody. You don't have that Zoom fatigue that happens from having to stare at the screen all the time. I just think the live chat, it's a game changer in terms of student participation. Would I like to have students standing next to me asking me questions in person? Of course I would, but I will take this live video chat any day over students playing Animal Crossing during a Zoom call. Tell me in the chat if you guys did that, by the way. Let's confess and give the old farts, those of us who are older than 40, the actual evidence that that's what you guys were doing. It's really true. Let's see, let's move on and show you guys what else is going on. Sarah is asking a question. Do you know if Google Meet is as problematic as Zoom for live video? I have not used Google Meet, Sarah, but the thing I do know is that that is not live streaming software. And so anything which is not made for live idea, because again, you have the issues with the lag and students not be able to access things. It's like you're using something which it's like you're trying to make a chicken salad into a dinosaur salad. It's like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> like, no, 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 not going to happen. Okay. Um, so here's the other thing you can do in live video. You can have two cameras. So usually I put my webcam on my face anymore and I'm just this audio recording. I just don't think the connection is quite as strong. And especially in the fall, a lot of you guys are going to be teaching students you probably never met in person before. And so I think them really being able to see your face makes a really big difference. Miss Anita says, how do you turn off video on Zoom and only lose use live chat? Well, what you would just do, Anita, is you would just say to everybody, nobody has to have their video on. Everybody just do audio and let's just talk. I mean, honestly, I think the reason why people have so much trouble with Zoom is the looking. It's like having to look at that screen. It's exhausting. And I think with this, those of you guys who are watching this live stream right now, look at your habits. How many of you are glaring at your stream at me right now? Most of you are not. Probably you're doing something else, drinking some coffee, you're typing in a little bit. It's very relaxed. It is not something that demands a huge amount of attention. And you know something else, guys? Everybody answer this. When I was in Zoom calls, because I did a whole bunch this past semester when I was at RISD, you know who I looked at? I looked at myself. I did not look at the students. Like there would be 
five screens of students and me. And I always looked at myself and not because I like looking at myself. I don't know why, but just this whole argument about students have to be on video on Zoom. It is not a good idea. And I know a lot of students felt very much that it was an invasive feeling that people were really invading their privacy in a way. And so I'm just really not a fan of having students on video unless it's so necessary. And at this point, I have not found it to be necessary in any particular area. Heidi says, are there accessibility issues if everyone has to type in their questions in chat? I personally am enjoying the chat over a Zoom meeting. Well, here's the thing. If you are just having a discussion, let's say there's no visual you have to reference, you're just talking about something, then you can just talk in Zoom. That's no problem. I'm talking about demos, things where you actually have visuals that you have to refer to. I think this is a lot better to do. Okay, now the other cool thing about these streaming software platforms is you can add images and you can also resize them and you can crop them. And so I can make these images any size I want. I can move them across. It's so, so much fun to make those changes. You can even do things like window capture. So one thing that I've been doing in my figure drawing tutorials is I will actually do a window capture of Google Timer I will put it into OBS. And so in my live drawing streams, you can actually watch a timer count down the pose and things like that are really fun to do. So basically anything that you can get on your laptop can go onto the OBS software. Yeah, like Don C's World is saying, video also is an equity issue. Yeah, and again, like I don't know teachers what the concerns are for privacy. Every school system, every school is going to have a completely different version of that. And I think in the end, what you can do is take what I'm giving you basic concepts and then customize and tweak accordingly, because this will not work for everybody. It's going to work for some people, but not for everybody necessarily. And you know something else, you guys, it really is okay to use other people's videos. And there's been a lot of conversations about this in the Facebook groups about people really saying like, I really have to record every single demo in my class. And I understand the thought behind that because it's your class. In theory, you would be doing all those things. And some people feel like, oh, well, it's not really my class if I'm not giving them my content. But you know what, guys? Again, like, don't make a Lotus Fold artist book tutorial. When we have one on our prof, that I spent hours and hours and hours editing that's really easy to follow that gets the point across. It's like, do we really need to reinvent the wheel for every single tutorial and technique that's out there? What I would do though, let's say you're an art teacher and you use this Lotus Fold artist book tutorial from Art Prof. What I would do though, give the students the video and say, here's the video, watch this, and then record an audio recording that says, Here's where I think the tutorial goes a little bit wonky, or this is one step you guys can skip, or you can say, now think about this process, which is explained here, and I want you to contextualize it into this assignment. So this is not as cut and dry as, here's someone else's video, go watch it. It's here, watch this resource, I'm gonna contextualize it for you and make it make sense within what we are studying so it's a lot more customized. So there is no shame in doing this, you guys, because you know what? When you've got videos like PBS's Art 21, which if you've not seen this series before, it's outstanding. I mean, it's wonderful videos, intimate interviews with world-class contemporary artists. When you have a free art history website like Smart History, you can go there. You got artprof.org, we're 100% free. It's like, why are we trying to everybody recustomize every single tutorial? It really just is not necessary. Emily is asking, how do you do live demos and follow the chat at the same time? I'm not good at multitasking. Usually what I do, Emily, is in my mind, like this is what I'm doing right now. Right now I'm saying, Clara, take a few minutes, look at the chat. Don't look at the slideshow that's going on. So that's what I'm doing right now. And then I say, okay, I answered your question. Now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna do this. So it's just like switching gears. It's just saying, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that because I am not multitasking. <laughs> Trust me, I am not 
reading the chat and trying to lecture at the same time. That is like totally impossible. But you know something, you guys, we will talk about this in a little bit, but people are very forgiving about live video and things going wrong. Because here's another thing about live video, things are gonna go wrong. They just are. I mean, I've been doing this for five years and I don't think I've ever done a live stream where every single thing was perfect. That's ridiculous, that's not gonna happen. But here's the thing, and this is another reason to do live video over pre-recorded, people are so forgiving about it. Like right now, if I made a mistake and spilled coffee on myself, would you guys judge me and say, oh, Clara, she's spilled coffee. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Who is she? If you are, you know, screw you. Who cares? I don't care. How many of you guys are looking at my neck and saying, wow, her sternocleidomastoid, it's like a little thin for a woman her age. I mean, like, yeah, people can think things like that, but I could care less. And chances are you guys are here for the information. You're not because of my skin and you want to see my wrinkle. Like, who cares about that crap? Does not matter. On live video, people really, really, I think, don't care about that type of thing. Let's see. Afra says, there's so much content out there. You are still curating what you are showing. Yeah, you are. I mean, I think ultimately there are many, many options, different ways to go. So let's talk about this concept also. This is a very common issue. Video, not always better. It is not. And this is a really common misconception amongst everybody, not just teachers, okay? Here's why no video is not always better. Why do you guys think there's the phrase Zoom fatigue going around? Because Zoom is exhausting. And I did Zoom calls with my students and I broke up my students into small groups of four or five students. So I only do a Zoom call only one hour at a time. And so for them, it was not that long. For me, it was a while. After I did four Zoom calls in an afternoon, I would take a nap, okay? And I think I'm a pretty energetic person. I have pretty good stamina and it was really hard for me. And I really truly think the Zoom fatigue is from the looking at the screen and looking at other people. And the other thing you guys is if you have a bad video, it can backfire. Like a lot of people think, oh, if I do a video, it must be in her middle school that she did remotely. And I watched some of the videos. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it, you know? So <laughs> I watched one of these videos and 80% of the video screen was the top of the teacher's head. And actually only about 10% of them, I said, this is useless. I'm like, at this point, I might as well just be listening to an audio. Like that's just totally ridiculous to think about it that way. And so at that point, it's like, geez, that was a total waste of connecting to Zoom and we couldn't get together. So I said, you know what, just call me, okay? And then afterwards I thought, wow, that was not very exhausting the way a Zoom call was exhausting. And I was like, why? I was like, oh, there was no visual component. I was like kicking up my legs. I was like leaning up against the sofa. It was like not a big deal. So guys, video is not king. You use video when you have to, when there is no other option. If you can do audio, do it. Okay. Much, much better. You guys. Anita is saying, I'm downloading OBS right now. Which do I click optimize for streaming or recording? I'm going to get to that. But Anita, if you want to stream, I would do stream. I mean, recording is a lot easier, so I would not worry about that so much. Okay, so let's take a look. The live chat, you guys are doing this right now and you can tell me your observations. Students can ask questions. In fact, it's easier, I think, because some students actually said to me, sometimes I feel like I get kind of lost in the classroom because there's so many students. But if you guys type your question in the chat, I'm not gonna lose track of it. And if I'm running a classroom, I can say something like, okay, let's now look at the chat and go over all the questions. Students can reply to you. Like right now, you guys, we're having a conversation right now. And I think a lot of people think, oh, this would be better if Clara and everybody right now were on Zoom together, but really would it be? Like ask yourselves right now, what we're doing, this conversation we're having, would you be getting more out of it if we were in a Zoom call and you were on video? I don't think so. I actually think this is much better in my opinion. You guys can talk to each other. I can see already a whole bunch of you guys are replying to each other. That's fabulous. Also, teachers, you will guys will like this. You know who watched live. It's really easy. There's an archive of who showed up when. You can ask the students to type in to record their attendance. And yes, I know they could go for a three hour break 
and you wouldn't know, but same thing with Zoom. I mean, that's not new. There are certain things that you have to accept with remote learning. Yeah, like Ed is saying right now, Zoom would not improve this experience. Rebecca says, I'd be looking at myself, thinking about myself too much. And Alice says, no, I have no bra and I'm eating dinner. Exactly, that's what the students were doing. And now you guys can do it, totally braless, eat your chicken fingers, whatever it is, and just relax and listen. It's way, way better. Okay, so here's another really cool thing that I discovered teachers that you guys are gonna like this, okay? I did not expect this to happen. It sort of happened by accident, but I've been doing these live figure drawing demos and people are drawing along with me. People are whipping out their sketchbooks and their pencils. They got me on their laptop. They're drawing my reference photo. And then the super cool thing about that as well, then we go into Discord. By the way, if you're not in the Art Prof Discord channel, huh, you are not cool. You better go down to the video description below and join us because you know something, educators? There's a huge number of teaching channels in there that I really wish had more activity. The other ones are bigger because there's just more art students in general. But join us on Discord and that's what I've been doing is people will take these pictures of the work that they make and teachers, you can do that too. You can say, I want you guys to draw along with me during the live stream and then afterwards, I want you to post it in our class chat. That is a productive way to use a live stream because then students can do it at their own pace and they don't have to feel like they're on video and that they're being watched. Like it's just not cool to make people feel that way, in my opinion. Heidi says, I like the idea of contextualizing other videos with my audio. Will you go back on how to do that best? Well, I do have information about how to give students audio recordings. Like if you just wanna record something really quick, what I usually do is I will record it in the voice memo app in my phone. And then I have the Google Drive app on my phone. And then it literally, it's like three taps to get it into the student's Google Drive folder, which for me is home base. I put all my student stuff in Google Drive. And if you go to my other videos, I do go over exactly how to do that. So we're not gonna cover that today, but that's the really quick, short answer. Sarah is saying, what is Discord? Discord is basically a chat form. And this is how you know how old people are because people over the age of 40 usually don't know <laughs> what Discord is. Discord is pretty new, but it's really hot with younger people, I think because a lot of people use it for gaming. A lot of people use it for fandoms. And so chances are the students you guys have in high school, middle school and college they probably are already on Discord. It's just that I have not really seen a lot of teachers using it. Last semester at RISD, I used Instagram group chat. That's how I chatted with my students. But I'll tell you, if I was setting it up again this semester, I would do Discord. Discord is much better. You can set up different channels. I was even consulting with a university department because they hired me to help them strategize their department remote learning plan. And I said to them, look, if I were you guys, I would make a Discord channel, Discord server for the entire department. And you could have different channels for different courses. That way everything's in one place because the thing that's driving the students insane and students back me up on this, the teachers are making students go to eight different platforms. It's making them nuts. I mean, I am watching students navigate Panopto, Blackboard, Canvas, Loom, YouTube, email, it's, it's like so out of control. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm a teacher. And I feel like that makes my head wanna explode. And we're asking people who are 15 to do that. So what I'm trying to tell people is just use as few platforms as you can as a teacher. Again, you do have limits depending on your school and what your school will or will not let you do. But that is in a nutshell, what you guys wanna try to do as few platforms as possible. Yeah, um, Margaret's saying we have great fun on the Discord after the live streams. Yeah, that's what I do. After the live stream, I'll go into Discord, hang out with you guys. I can answer more questions that I didn't get to earlier. Now, see, this is what I'm saying about people being forgiving about errors during live videos. And honestly, I think the reason why a lot of teachers felt the need to do pre-recorded edited videos 
is because they did worry about errors and they did worry about, oh no, this is not just right. Oh no, my hair doesn't look good. And I had a ton of teachers say, my hair, I'm like, sorry to burst your bubble, but uh, you're a high school student, does not care about your hair. It does not matter. I get it. It is hard to be on video. If it is something that you have not done a lot, it's very intimidating and it does take time to get over that self-consciousness. But once you get over it, you realize, yeah, my students don't care about my hair. It really does not matter. And it's okay to mess up. I messed up. I told Maria Rev that her idea for Premiere on YouTube wasn't a good idea. And then I changed my mind. I mean, like, sure, that's fine, <laughs> right? So anyway, Marie Louise says, my grown up children are very impressed. I had Discord installed on my phone. I will join sometime. You should, it's really fun. Discord is super, super cool. Now here's the cool thing with live video. You've got both synchronous and asynchronous because you can watch it live and you can watch it again later. So it's like, why would you not want to do this? With pre-recorded, half of your options disappear. And so with live video, there's just so much more to be gained. And with pre-recorded, you're basically closing a lot of doors in terms of how you can deliver the content. Okay, so let me go over the setup. I'm going to give you guys the overview of exactly the individual components, the technology. Then I'm going to tell you specifically what brands, what is good to get, what is great to get, and what you can live without. Okay, so just bear with me. It's a ton of information, but remember, you can always go back and watch this later if it's too much to absorb all at once. So first of all, Got to have your laptop. I think that's a no brainer. Got to have a mic right next to your laptop. It is really nice if you can have a second monitor. Totally not necessary. This is like that little frill that you add on an ice cream cake. It's like really not a big deal, but it's pretty and it's nice. And it does help because at a certain point, if you do a lot of live streaming like I do, you end up with so many open windows and it's just really hard to navigate on a single laptop. But again, for most of you, you'll be fine with just your laptop. Then I do think it's really helpful to take the time and get a daylight lamp with a lighting umbrella, because you know something, I would say the two toughest things about the physical setup would be lighting and camera angles. Those are the two things that I find I spend the most time troubleshooting. And if you can get yourself a daylight lamp with a lighting umbrella, all your lighting problems are gonna disappear in two seconds. If you don't have that, you're gonna have to deal with color correction, trying to get the right brightness, the right darkness. I know some people say, oh, we'll use natural light. That's so much easier. Yeah, but then you can only do it during the day and if your window is at the wrong angle and you're left-handed, I mean, just if you can, I know it's not an option for everybody. A daylight lamp like this is like $150. You'll have it forever. And this is not the only thing you can use it for. I use these lamps to shoot photographs. I use them to shoot photos of my artwork. This is a pretty good investment. And if you can, I really, really recommend it. A mic stand. This is the one piece of equipment that I literally have not seen anybody else using and it has saved my life. <laughs> Those of you guys using GoPros and phone stands and put that stuff aside. The mic stand is here to save the day. And I will explain to you guys more exactly how that functions. You can attach your webcam to your mic stand with a rubber band and so, yeah, technically speaking, the mic stand is for mics, but I am reappropriating it as a webcam instead of having like a crappy tripod or something like that. Because the other issue I found, and teachers, tell me if you have this problem as well. I did this too. I made the mistake where I was doing a drawing demo and I had like a tripod on the table where I was doing the demo. But because drawing is pretty physical, I would like draw really rigorously and then it would shake the table, which would then shake the tripod, which would then shake the camera. And so I'd end up with these demos where the camera was shaking because of that. And so what's really nice about the mic stand is it's totally standing by itself. It's not on the table. It's not attached to your laptop. It's totally its own thing. So it will not budge or move no matter how rigorously 
you move during your drawing demo. Jay Cabby says, where do you draw with the laptop and second monitor in the way? I'll show you. I've got an image of me actually sitting there. I just want to introduce the stuff first. And Maria Rev says, how is the daylight lamp different from a regular lamp with daylight bulbs? I think for me, this particular lamp that I have, it's pretty powerful. And I know a regular lamp, usually the bulbs are not that strong. And so it might be the right color, but it's like, it's not bright enough to really like soak the whole area. The lighting umbrella is great because it diffuses the light. And that's important because if you have a light where the light is too strong and too concentrated, you're gonna end up with a drawing demo where part of it's really bright and another part is really dark. And you guys will see in my streams that the lighting's really even. It's because of that lighting umbrella. That's what's making that happen. Okay, then this might seem silly, but this is important. I always have a stool next to me for my supplies and for a water bottle because you don't wanna have to get up. Once you're all set up and ready to go, you wanna have everything there and available. And this is also important, a chair with no wheels. I am right now sitting in a regular office chair with wheels, that's fine. But in a drawing demo, you need to be able to get back to the same position. So I have found that to be very, very important. Luis, I'm gonna get to the webcam in a little bit. So this is what I do is since I have a chair with no wheels, I actually take blue painter's tape and I mark spots because sometimes I have a position where I'm lecturing. I have a position where I'm demonstrating and I don't wanna have to figure that out during a live stream. So I just tape the floor and then I know really quickly how to get back and forth between those positions. So this is what it looks like. I'm not doing this right now, but in theory, I am sitting at this chair and I put my drawing board. So the top of my drawing board is right up against the table. And yes, this is not ideal in my perfect world, I would be sitting on a drawing horse, I would be at an easel, I'd be doing all those things, okay? So this is not quite exactly how I would prefer to work, but this is the best case result, all things considered, because it's a lot of equipment. Like once you have a light, a mic stand, a webcam, it's like it really does limit your mobility. And I will talk about easels in a minute because I think easels are a huge problem. And honestly, if you're somebody who draws, this is better. And yes, I know there's distortion because obviously you're looking at the drawing fairly flat. So things aren't gonna be just right, but things are funky anyway, because you're online and because you're using a webcam. So that is not really a problem. The biggest issue I think that comes up later is when things block the camera view and that really does become a problem. Okay, so let's go over the equipment. So you guys know what the options are and tell me in the chat, teachers, what you guys have been using, anything that you thought was particularly useful for any reason, or maybe even to tell the rest of us, hey, steer clear of this one mic stand, it was really terrible. Because I think the more we can put out our ideas, that would be a really good thing. A Frez says Hero 8 has a mic mode and light add-on. I have not seen that, but I think that if that works for you, go ahead. My biggest issue, if you guys look at this, is that my drawing stream, I draw pretty big. I draw like 18 by 24. And so a lot of the equipment that I've seen people using, it's fine if you're working small, if you're working nine inches by 12 inches. But once you get to like 18 by 24, it really changes how you have to shift things. And I don't think we all wanna draw eight by 10 for the rest of our <laughs> online teaching lives. So I just really like this setup because it's like you can work bigger, but you can work smaller. Whereas if you work small and then you wanna go big, it's like, oh no, I gotta come up with a whole other setup. And so I would prefer to have one setup that does both at the same time. Okay, so here's what we go. Let's look at equipment. Okay, before we go over the good equipment, let's, I'm just gonna tell you guys the stuff I think is bad for different reasons, okay? These cell phone holders are a pain in the butt. Yes, they hold your phone, that's fine, but they're so unstable. I mean, it's like if you breathe on the cell phone holder, it's gonna move. And I own one, so I don't recommend it. This is not good at all. 
Sarah is saying, one problem I had with the Logitech webcam, it constantly went in and out of focus, especially on detailed pen and ink drawings. So what you need to do, Sarah, is you have to go in and you have to turn off autofocus and do the same thing for exposure, because if that's fluctuating during a live stream, yes, totally distracting. So you just gotta make sure you turn off the autofocus because I believe the default setting is autofocus. So you gotta turn that off. Okay. I don't recommend a DSLR camera, okay? Now, I use a DSLR camera for tons of our videos at ArtProf, but not for our live ones. It's overkill. A DSLR camera is like, I don't know, like getting a Corvette to like pose as a game piece on your <laughs> friend's Monopoly board or something. Like it's so over the top unnecessary. So, I just would not do, I mean, DSLR camera is like, my webcam moves around a lot because I have to position it in different ways. The DSLR is not easy to position unless you have a really expensive tripod, which a lot of people don't have. I have one, but I don't think most people have that. Christian saying, I've started using a DSLR. The image is so much better. Just need to download some free software. It's better, but in my opinion, Christian, it is not worth the headache and hassle it is to set up a DSLR camera because I'm using a webcam, okay? And the webcam to me is so much better than my laptop camera, okay? And the thing is, you guys, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but actually the quality of the video matters less than the quality of the audio. And I will talk about that in a little bit. I'm sorry I'm jumping around a lot. I'm just trying to get to people's questions and not making everybody wait forever and ever. Don't get one of these octopus tripods. These are the worst. They're impossible. I mean, I know people look at them, they go, wow, look at how flexible that is. You can move it around. I'm like, yeah, and you'll never get it in the same position ever again. The thing about my rubber band and webcam, I can set it up the exact same way every time. It's pretty much the same. This octopus tripod, good luck. I mean, this is like saying, can you rebuild this like Lego building from scratch with no plans or kit or any, it's just a nightmare. So I really don't recommend that. Rebecca saying, what about a point and shoot? Not necessary guys, get the webcam. You need to get the equipment and the software that is made for the purposes that you need it for, okay? In certain circumstances, like my mic stand thing, I'm using the mic stand for something else, but it's because nothing really exists out there. Maybe somebody should invent it. But what I'm saying is use the webcam for web streaming live video. That makes a lot more sense. The DSLR thing, it's like, we do have videos on Art Prof that are shot all on DSLR cameras and they're super high quality, but I have really big expensive tripods that are easy for me to do. And I don't think I can expect people, um, the average art teacher to be doing that. David is saying, would a vlogging camera work? Are you talking about like a GoPro? That's sort of what I think when you say. Um, if that's your question, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> so my issues with the GoPro, tripod is so short. It's not flexible. It's not a webcam. I mean, the webcam is so easy for me to configure onto the mic stand. I'll show it to you guys in a little bit. Also, I know a lot of people really would like to be able to use their smartphones for these demos, but again, the smartphone is very flawed. Couple of reasons. Battery power is a big problem because especially if you wanna stream like a pretty long video, you have to worry about it being charged. It's also really hard to adjust the camera angle because the phone is like this big, flat, clunky thing. And I'll show you guys in a minute, the webcam, actually has like this movement in it where you can change the angle very, very quickly. And the smartphone, not easy to plug into OBS. You can, but you have to pay for an app and you have to download a bunch of plugins. It's a pain in the butt. And you know how I know? I tried to do it yesterday and I did not succeed. It took me a couple hours. I was like, oh, I don't wanna pay $10 for this app. It was very annoying. Like I'd much rather get the webcam if I can and not use the smartphone. I mean, ultimately, the thing I would say, you guys, about this equipment, use what you think is best, okay? I cannot tell you what is gonna work best for your situation, your style, whatever. I just think what I have seen a lot is people just 
doing things and making it unnecessarily difficult when it doesn't have to be. So again, do however works for you guys, but I'm gonna show you what works for me. Okay, Anita, I am gonna talk about the webcam and what that setup looks like in a minute. I don't recommend demoing on an easel. This is a really bad idea. I have done it so many times on our fancier film shoots with big tripods and things like this. The camera angle, it's impossible. And so even with a really good camera and fancy, big, expensive tripods and a whole full out studio and crew, I was never able to get in a position where I could draw the way I normally do and get the angle I wanted. Something had to suffer. Either the angle was like a little bit off or I had to like change the angle of my body to the easel so that something wasn't in the way. And so my feeling is that, yeah, a lot of us would rather work on an easel, but for me, the not having the hassle of like working in the strange point of view is like really a big pain. So I don't recommend this, you guys. All right, so I do recommend getting a mic and there are many, many bikes out there. I have this one, which is a blue snowball, it's about $50. And this is essential. This is another common misconception that I think people don't understand about online teaching. And that's that audio quality, more important than video quality. I know, doesn't that sound so weird? Because you're like, it's a video. Of course, the video is more important. No, think about it this way, you guys, and tell me in the chat. Let's say you guys watch a video on YouTube and the video quality is not great. It's like a little fuzzy, but you can still see stuff. You still get it you're gonna probably keep watching. You're gonna go, okay, I really do need to know how to cut an artichoke, so I found it, I'm gonna watch this. If you find a video on YouTube and you start watching it and the sound is terrible, let's say the sound is so quiet that you can't hear it or there's a sound in the background and you can't really understand what the person's saying, you're gonna turn it off. That's the difference, guys. So that's why earlier that comment about DSLR camera video quality being so much better, it's like, yeah, it's nice, but actually between the two, the audio should be the priority because people are very willing to put up with flawed video, but they're not willing to put up with flawed audio. So I really recommend that you guys prioritize the mic. That is the most important thing. If there's only one thing you can buy, buy the mic. That's, that's super, super important. All right, so this is the webcam that I have. And what you guys can see that's really nice about it is that everybody see the like curve of it. It's like you can change the angle of it in so many different ways and it hooks onto your laptop. And this is what I do is I just attach it to the mic stand with a rubber band and I can even here angle it back and forth. So that's the difference. Like you can't do this with a phone. You can't do this with a GoPro. I could never hang my DSLR camera like this. I mean, no way. It would totally fall down because it was too heavy. And so that's one of the things I really like about the webcam, it's flexible. You can change the angle, it's very lightweight. And I don't have problems putting it in funny situations because it's so easy and malleable to work with. Alice DB says, yes, but both are very important for YouTube, but for teaching online, the sound must at least be very good. Yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be great for both to be perfect. It's just, I know people have limited budgets and depending on your technology and software, it's like, just prioritize the audio because at the very least people will understand what you were saying to them. So this is what I'm saying about adjusting the angle of the webcam. Does everybody see in these two photos the webcam is in the same position. I have not changed it, but actually the front part of it, you can like flip it back and forth pretty dramatically. And I haven't really had to do anything. And then with a the phone, you, you literally would have to like flip the whole thing back and forth. Like you really would have to change the position. On the webcam, you don't. You just flip the front back and forward. Okay, this is the stool. I put it next to me for supplies and water, definitely necessary for live streams. Second monitor, really helpful because you can manage lots of open windows. I've got multiple windows open right now. And these are the two items that I recommend for lighting. 
And by the way, if you guys want links for these items, they are all in the video description below. So if you wanna get Amazon links, they're all Amazon affiliate links. You guys can just click on those. ArtProf gets a small percentage of that to help fund our content. And so you can get this daylight LED light and the lighting umbrella, really helpful guys. Because again, it diffuses the lighting, makes the lighting very, very even and easy to follow. So here's what I have is I just put the webcam attached with a rubber band on top and this tripod boom mic stand, it's like $40 guys, it's not expensive. And this thing saved my life. Like everything is different now because I have this boom mic stand. So I really recommend it. So what's great about the mic stand, it's just so flexible. You can move it at any angle you want. You can go up and down, you can tilt this way, you can tilt that way. And the thing is, I have yet to find any tripod or cell phone holder that has remotely this degree of flexibility. And that flexibility is so helpful because as I'm gonna show you guys in a little bit, the hardest thing about this setup, the physical setup is getting the right camera angle. And with the mic stand, you have 10 times more options than you do with a GoPro. You probably have a thousand times the options as you do with a phone. And so to me, that flexibility in itself is really, really worth it. So this is what you guys will, well, I guess you don't see this, but <laughs> behind the scenes, when I'm setting up for a demo, I do a lot of this where I'm just like sitting in the position I'm tweaking things. I'm moving the webcam a little forward, a little bit backward. This is the part that takes a lot of time. Like even somebody who has a lot of experience doing this, it is hard to do. I mean, for me, when I set up a live drawing stream, I give myself an hour. Part of that is that I'm paranoid and I don't like to rush myself, but those angles are not easy to do. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do them. Let's talk about some common problems. Getting the right camera angle is so hard. <laughs> Tell me in the chat, if you're a teacher, would you say this is accurate? It's so hard. Like I feel like half my time doing the physical setup is getting the right camera angle. It's really, really hard. So here's why it's hard. Oftentimes when you guys just turn on your webcam and you put up your easel or whatever you're doing, you'll get something like this where it's like, okay, it's off center, it's tilted, the image is too small. So all kinds of things that you have to adjust to get just the right camera angle. So in a situation like this, what I try to do first is I try to make the drawing board parallel to the camera view, okay? So does everybody see here how the drawing board is at this weird, awkward diagonal tilt? What I'm gonna try to do with the mic stand is to tilt it to make it parallel. That's really, really helpful. Daisy is saying, having never used a webcam, is it showing your view in the computer as you go? That'd be such an advantage, yes. And I'm gonna show you when I demonstrate how to use OBS, you will see all these components in a single window. I'm just breaking it down because if I did it, everything at once, you guys would just die of overwhelmed, lumming information, so yeah. All right, let's see. Yep, Daisy saying camera angle was what took me all my time this summer. And Karen got a $40 ring light, came with two arms, one to hold the webcam. Yeah, that's great. So those are really great options, guys. So usually when I'm trying to line up the drawing board and make it parallel to the edge of the screen, it's some version of either pushing the webcam forward to get that adjustment, or it's actually pulling the webcam back. So that's why I really like the mic stand because there's just so much flexibility in order to get that. And ultimately what you end up with is this. So the first, let's say pass of the camera angle is on the left. And then by pushing the webcam forward or back, you actually even it out so you get the image on the right hand side. So that's the first fix, okay? Now you don't stop there though, because now you can see, obviously you can see my laptop in the view. That's not good either. And that's where adjusting the webcam angle can push your view either up or lower down. 
And again, if you had to do a smartphone, like you'd have to reposition the whole thing. This is just me with my finger doing this with the webcam. And so what you end up with is something like this. So you have the image on the left. I have now tilted my webcam upwards. So the image on the right, you can actually see more of the drawing, okay? We're not done yet though, there's still more adjusting. Now in OBS, which I will demonstrate in a little bit, you can resize and crop the camera view, okay? So if I wanted to, and I didn't wanna show those drawing board clips at the top, I could just crop them out. That would be very easy. I could also crop out the right-hand side so it's only the image, but sometimes it's the position of the mic stand. Like maybe you can't get any further down. So what I usually do is I will just move the mic stand further up or further back on the floor. And usually what you end up with after that happens is something like this. So I've gone from the image on the left and then I move the mic stand so I have the image on the right, which is now very close to what I actually want. And then at that stage, very easy to resize and recrop in OBS. So here's the thing, it's like there's so many options, but it's like these certain pieces of equipment they just streamline the process. So instead of having to do 15 different things with 10 different objects, you do six different things with two objects. It just really consolidates everything a lot. Lehman Art says, would you recommend a webcam over a professional camera? Yep, no reason to use a DSLR for live streaming. DSLR is for like heavy duty, super pro, production, which is what we do at ArtProf, okay? But you guys aren't doing that. You're teaching remotely. That is not the same thing. Colleen says, recommendation for a good, reasonably priced mic stand. I have links for all the items that I'm talking about in the video description below. So those are Amazon affiliate links. ArtProf does get a cut from that. But yeah, all the links are down there. And Daisy says, also, unlike a tripod with a mic stand, you can probably make that move in one gesture instead of screwing and snapping and bending, exactly. So that's the thing, it's like with a phone, you're actually changing the position of the whole phone. A webcam, it's like meh, it's like that's it, that's the difference. So it's like the mic stand, people might say, wow, that's so big and dramatic, but it's like the flexibility increases 500%. That's the difference. You're, you're really there for the flexibility in terms of the angle. Here's another problem. Tell me again, teachers in the chat, was this an issue, your camera view getting blocked. A lot of the times it's getting blocked by the webcam wire because it's dripping down from the mic stand. And so this is a really um, advanced fix <laughs> where like a caveman, I take blue painter's tape, I just tape it to the mic stand and I'm done. So this is the funny thing is I think sometimes for live streaming, I am pretty technologically, I don't know, sophisticated in terms of streaming software and stuff, but other stuff like this, I'm like, yeah, just tape it, it's fine. <laughs> so you can do Neanderthal-like moves like that. This is a big problem that I ran into for several of my streams. And if you guys wanna feel better, go back and watch my earlier streams. You're gonna see this happening a lot, which is basically if you don't position your webcam high enough and far enough, from your head, if you lean like just a few inches, your head can block the webcam. And that is a problem because this is not a good view. Also, I don't know that I want people looking at the top of my head. And so tell me in the chat if this was a problem because it took me a while actually to figure out how to solve this. And a lot of it was because of the mic stand. It was just the positioning of it. But this is very common. It's like your elbows in the way or the top of your head or, it's like, yeah, Lehman Art is saying, I've been looking into a boom arm for my mic, cool. So here's what you do with the mic stand, you can put it up pretty high. And I'll show you guys again that photo, you'll notice my webcam is high up. It is not close to me. And I get the feeling that a lot of people, their demo space is like this big. My demo space is very big. And so because my webcam is so high up, it's so far ahead of me, I never worry about my head being in the way anymore. And it was a big problem for me for a really, really long time. 
Yeah, so then you end up with something like this where it's like, you can see my arm. And in this particular view you guys are looking at, I actually can bend really far like this, but my head will never show up because I have the webcam positioned high enough and far enough that that's just not possible. It's physically impossible for me to block my own view. Yeah, Sarah says, <laughs> my head certainly made awkward appearances in a video I made. And Carol says, a really severe case of poison ivy blisters. Oh no, that is really unpleasant. Sorry you had to deal with that. A friends says, I was reading somewhere that for live streaming on YouTube, you need to have a thousand subscribers. Is that right? You know something, you'll have to look that up because it's been so long that I've been on YouTube that I actually can't remember. And they're always changing those things. So yeah, double check and see, because um, I can't remember what the rules are for that. And Daisy's saying, also you get more table space when the cam is so high and the tripod is not on the table. Yeah, because when I did do that, guys, I had the cell phone holder all the dumb things that I'm talking about, I did them all. That, how do you guys think I know about this? <laughs> because I messed it up too. So I had a cell phone camera uh, holder on my table and it's like, it really cramps your style. When you have the tripod only equipment right in front of you, having the mic stand, it's like, wow, I'm like free. I can like do all these things and it's like, it doesn't matter. So anyway, <laughs> all right. Now this is what somebody had mentioned earlier about the focus changing. So video exposure, this is another thing that I think people easily forget about. And I know, cause I did as well. <laughs> the only way you guys truly learn things is to mess it up yourself. And so if you look at this slide, this is an ink wash drawing demo that I did a little ways back. And you'll notice that in this image, the painting is very overexposed. Like if you look at this, that's what the actual image is supposed to look like. But you can see here, it looks terrible. Like you're missing half of the image because it's overexposed. So what I would make sure you guys do in your webcam settings, you gotta make sure you turn off the auto settings. A lot of the settings are default auto. So it's auto focus, auto exposure, auto frame rate. You gotta turn them off because otherwise every time the tones shift in your camera view, the exposure is gonna adjust. And so you're gonna end up with stuff like this where it fluctuates, gets dark, gets light, looks terrible. Go watch the stream, you can see it. You guys can watch all my mistakes on all my previous streams. Okay, so the other reason I think to use OBS, even if you don't wanna stream live, okay, you can also use OBS just to record, okay? So I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, I'm doing, um, screencasting or I'm just doing screen capture with Camtasia or something like that. Honestly, if I was not streaming live and I just was doing pre-recorded, I would still use OBS. So I will show you guys exactly why, but that's what's so great about OBS is that if you set up OBS, you can stream live if you want to. And if you don't want to, you can just record. You can make a video file in OBS, which you can then upload somewhere else. So that is a really nice thing about OBS, just having all of those customizable options. Okay, let's see, Maureen, thank you very much, did the research. YouTube, a thousand subscriber requirement is live stream from mobile. Webcam and computer live streaming doesn't have limits. Thank you very much for doing that research. Okay, so basically what you do is you hook up your OBS software to your YouTube channel. And let me show you guys how that works. So what you have to do is you set up a YouTube channel and you go into what's called your live dashboard. So that is a screen you go to when you want to go live. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a little section key. Then you go into OBS, you're gonna download it from OBS. Just look it up, really, really easy. And when you open OBS, on the lower right, there's a little button that says settings. You gotta click on that. Then in this window stream anymore. Felicia says to shoot a demo time-lapse, I put my phone on a selfie stick with a phone adapter. Stick is attached to a tripod standing to my left. The phone is positioned right in front of my chest. Wow, I'd love to see what that looks like, Felicia. <laughs> that sounds like some setup, very cool. Okay, so 
basically just look up OBS really easy. You're going to download it. And when you guys open it, it's going to look like this. So here I am. I'm going to actually switch to here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you guys how to actually create templates in OBS that you can then use for reference. Now, this is the really cool thing, you guys, is if you look through this, I have so many templates. I mean, it's really amazing <laughs> how many templates. I mean, for those of you guys who just watch us at ArtProf, this, this really is behind the scenes because we have so many different templates and I'm always changing things with the logos and there, there's even little things like we have these transition scenes that we put in and sometimes I just import a lot of our tutorials. Like I just keep stuff in here just so I can quickly cut and paste our content. So what's really nice about all this stuff is once you get all of these things up and ready to go, it really, it just does itself. So again, it's a lot of work in the beginning. I, I'm not going to say that it is not, but it is definitely, I think, really worth your time. Okay, so basically what you want to do when you go into OBS, you want to come here. So there's basically these two windows, okay? This one is called scenes and this one is called sources. So this whole thing you're looking at here, this is a scene, okay? So a scene is basically like a template that you decide to create. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and let's see, I'm going to click new scene. You're gonna click prop plus. So let's just type in, let's see, video, video, demo, let's do okay. All right, so now I have a blank scene, okay? There's nothing going on in here right now. And what you start doing is adding sources. So if I want to put my webcam in here, I'm gonna add a source. So go down here, press plus, and I'm going to add a, let's see, video capture device. Let's say Clara laptop video like that. And I'm going to do integrated webcam, do okay. And why am I not showing up? That always happens, right? Maybe I clicked the wrong source. Let's just make sure. Um, oh wait, you know what? I have to put in the audio capture actually. So let's do audio input. Let's do Yeti mic because that's what I have. We'll come back to the video source in a minute. Let's do okay. Okay, so does everybody see here? Now I have my audio working. And the way I can tell, does everybody see this, this here that just showed up? Okay, so if I hit my mic, you guys can see that it's working. Okay, so if I take this away like this, I delete it, I can get rid of it like that, then that disappears. So that's how you know that your audio is working because right now, if I were streaming, you wouldn't be able to hear me, but right now that is happening. Okay, so let's go in and try the video capture device again. So let's see, Ca Clara laptop camera. Oh, don't do that. Yeah, it doesn't like it when you uh, use similar names. So that's one thing actually that kind of annoys me because it's sort of like, really? That's really annoying. Okay, so laptop camera, let's put that in. Okay, this might be, oh, maybe I have to, let me see if it's, I don't wanna mess with my, see, here's the thing. It's I, This is way too complicated to explain to you guys, but basically I'm streaming through StreamYard, which is another <laughs> streaming software. So I'm using OBS and StreamYard right now. And I think that my camera's getting confused about which one it's in. So I'm just gonna go back to here and let's pretend I imported this. Okay, so that's where I am. This would be my webcam. Okay, so this, I can move this around. And what's fun about these is if I wanna make myself here, let me move this over here. You guys can take this and I can make myself really big. I can make myself really small. I can drag myself around and you can also crop. So if you guys tap alt on your keyboard, look at what happens here. So I can actually recrop, whoop, not that way. Here we go, there. So if I wanna show you guys my full view, this is actually my full view. So if I wanted to like make this really gigantic, I could totally do that. But like I said, you can crop. So I'm just gonna hit Alt and I'm gonna do this. And this lets me crop it into something that's a little bit smaller. And so this is really easy to do. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, the next thing you guys can also do is you can add an image. So let's do plus. 
do image and let's just say photo. All right, and you just browse. This is pretty straightforward. So let's go in and find something to import. Let's go into my YouTube live and we'll find some photo to import. Oh, I think my computer does not like having all of these various windows open. So it's taking a minute. Okay, here we go. So here, let's put in this file. Okay, so now I do okay. And now I have my image. So I can take this and I can resize it again. I can put it over here. I can do that and I can move it over here. And if I don't like it, I just click delete and say yes, and then I'm done. So it's really fun because you guys can customize this however you want. And the other cool thing is that this window is 1920 pixels by 1020 pixels. So what I oftentimes do is I will actually format my images in advance to a very particular size. So for example, if I am going into YouTube Live and let's say I want to put in, let's see, I'll just, maybe I'll pull up some staff artwork. So let's just say staff art, let's do Clara. Okay, so this is like an image of a show. So this image I'm selecting right now, the file size is 1080 pixels by 1080 pixels. So when I put it in, like this, you can say it fits perfectly, okay? Now you can put it in any size you want. It's just sometimes if I wanna like put in a bunch of images really quickly and I don't wanna bother having to resize them so much, that does save me a lot of time. So if you wanna cover the whole thing, you could have the image be 1920 images, 1920 pixels by 1020 pixels, and that works too. Here's another cool thing you guys can do is if you do plus and you add browser, you can actually add a page from a website. So let me come over here and I'm just gonna cut and paste. Um, let me see, I'll find a page that I can cut and paste for you guys, okay? So let's just call this browser, I'll do okay. Here we go. All right, so now this allows you to come in and I'm gonna just cut and paste, this is just a page and I'm gonna make it so it fills the whole window. So I'm going to do 1080 by 1080. And we're going to do OK. Now, isn't this cool? So this is just a web page. And I just stuck it in here. And this I can resize as well. So I can go in and I can do, I can click Alt here. Let me, I think this is not liking my second. Oh, here we go. OK, so let me get rid of that. Let's put this over here. OK, so now I can go in and I can do stuff like this. I can do Alt, do that or I can make it way bigger doing stuff like this, or I can make it smaller. So any web page that you guys wanna show in OBS, two seconds, just import it real, real fast. Let's see, Jay is saying, thanks for educating us. I had no idea about OBS and so many things. Well, yeah, I mean, nobody really has this stuff available online. And the thing is like as artists, we're doing stuff that nobody else does <laughs> like all these marketing people and tech people, like they have no idea what our actual needs are. And the thing is, I think it's really hard with all of this online stuff to know when is it worth it to learn software like OBS and when is it worth it to take a piece of tape and tape your <laughs> webcam so it doesn't get in your camera. It's really hard because sometimes the solution's a high tech one and other times it's a caveman solution. So it's like, it's really hard to know unless you're somebody like me who's done it a million times the wrong way. And then I can show you guys how to do that. Anita is saying, what video settings do you choose on OBS? You know, it's been so long since I've set up OBS, Anita, that I actually don't know what you're referring to, but I'll tell you the OBS website They've got tons of information and lots of FAQ sections. That I'm sure you could dig through. It's probably just a technical thing. I mean, if you're talking about the size of the window, I usually do 1920 by 1080. So let me put that in the chat right now. So window size in OBS is 1920 by 1080 pixels. And the reason I do that is because that's what YouTube uses. YouTube is 1920 by 1080. I mean, you could change it to whatever you want. But anyway, 
Uh, Alice is saying, which laptop do you use? I have a PC. I know I'm a weirdo. I'm the one artist that <laughs> uses a PC. It's mostly because my husband is tech support and he has a PC. So I sort of had no choice. Uh, David is saying PC with Windows 10. Yep. And Felicia is saying, is the imported web page live or just a still image? Oh, you mean, can you like click through it? I don't think so. I think it's just a still image because if I try to do anything with it, um, I can't really click on this or anything, but I found this very useful. Like, especially as a teacher, if you want to say to everybody, Hey guys, go to PBS art 21. You can just import the link and it's right there. And having that visual that will get your students to look at it. Because the other thing that I'm seeing a lot in a lot of the Facebook teacher groups is that a lot of people are sharing lots of Google Docs of resources, which is great. But you know something from a student point of view, a lot of the students to them, it's just a chunk of text. And so they look at that and they're like, Ugh, this is so boring. And so when you give them a visual, something like this, that they can actually like look at and have an image to relate to, it makes a really big difference. Let's see, and Alice says, and the professional videos that is not possible to make with Microsoft. Alice, are you talking about our studio tutorials that we shoot with the whole crew and DSLR camera and stuff like that? I wasn't sure. 19 by 20 by 1080, yep. Okay, uh, frames per second. I can't remember which one is better, so look it up. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. It's just been so long since I've done all these things. Okay, let me show you guys another thing that you can do, which is really cool. You can actually put a video into a video, okay? So if you go to sources and you go to video, VLC, video source, okay? We'll do that. You go to the plus and you do add files, okay? So now what I can do is I can come in here and I can put any video file I want, something that has been pre-made. So I'm gonna go in here and let's do this. So I'm gonna add this video like that. Okay, let's do okay. All right, so does everybody see here when I click this off, I'm gonna hide this, the video stops, okay? So if I wanna play this video again, I just click it like this. So we've used this a lot at Art Prof actually, because sometimes we have an ad we want to put in, or sometimes it's like a student video that we're critiquing. And so it's really nice to be able to put a video into another video if you have that need, especially if you have footage or something else that you guys want to show. And then another thing you can do is you can do window capture like this. So I'll show you guys how to do this. So here you can pick, because I've got all these different windows open right now. Like I have StreamYard open, I have a calculator open. So I could say, show you guys this, this will be a trip. <laughs> Look at this, this is gonna get a little meta, you guys, okay? So here, this is screen capture of what I'm looking at right now in real time, woo! <laughs> Does everybody see how weird this is? So th this is what's on my computer screen. I just happened to put it into OBS. And now you guys can see what my view looks like there. Whoa, this is getting like deep guys. I was not expecting that to happen. But anyway, this the window capture is really nice because you can get rid of that. Um, you, you can show people what's actually on your screen if you want. And if you wanna get rid of anything, you just click delete, do remove like that. And David is saying, for a long time, I thought you were screen sharing the website, but the screenshot makes more sense now that I think about it. Yeah, the screen sharing is just not necessary. Again, it's like overkill. Like, why do you need that when really just the image is good enough? So I think, again, it's like, why do all that extra stuff for features that you really are not going to be using? So Alice, you're asking about the studio tutorials, not possible. Well, so the studio, that's a whole other can of worms. I mean, that would take me forever and ever and ever for me to explain to you guys. I mean, the studio tutorials, we edit them in Premiere. We um, work on them for hours and hours and hours, and they're just extremely time consuming to produce. So um, that would take me a long time to really explain to you guys. 
Um, Karen is saying, I had OBS recommended to me by a 20 year old musician, streams his videos onto YouTube. Really appreciate these tutorials and how to set it up with the templates. Well, for us, it really matters, you guys, because I think if you're a musician, you probably don't need those multiple screens, but I'll show you guys when I do my demos on anatomy, I click between two templates, okay? So this template here is my demo template, all right? In theory, this is where I'd be drawing. I just can't do it now because my webcam is hooked up to StreamYard for this particular stream. But then sometimes if I wanna like stop and answer questions, because I know somebody earlier said, oh, if you're doing live stream video, how do you multitask? Well, I don't. So what I usually do is this is the template that I use when I'm drawing and actually doing the demo. And then when I'm ready to look at the chat and answer questions, I go here. And so now this is just me. And in a situation like this, I can bring up other things. Like I can say to students, here are the supplies that we're using. Or I can say to them, here is a video I would like you guys to look at. Or I could say, these are the videos about anatomy that I want you guys to reference. I can say to them, guess what? Here's artprof.org. It's like, there's all kinds of things. And literally to go back to the demo page, it's one click. Like that is so insanely easy, you guys. Like once you have this set up, it's awesome. Like it's just the greatest thing. Sally McKay is saying, how much of this would you do in real time while streaming? How much do you set up ahead of time before you start? Okay, great question. So what I'm doing right now in terms of adding sources and moving things around, doing that type of thing, this is all done in advance, okay? So all these templates that I'm showing you guys here, all these different versions, I have all this done well in advance. So you would definitely wanna do that. Um, the slideshows, like what I'm showing you guys before, that's all done in advance. So the whole thing about live streaming, guys, it is definitely, I think, more setup time for sure. But the thing is, once you click start streaming and go, you just go and then you're done. <laughs> and it's like these other people, I think, who I've been watching just like spending so much time that in my opinion is really unnecessary for doing your videos. It's just too much work because then it's like, you gotta record the voiceover, you have to go and you have to edit. And it's like, all of that stuff is a big pain in the butt, you guys. And so I think it's much easier to prep in advance and then you go and you're done. No editing, no voiceover, none of that. And then it takes care of itself. Like right now, I'm streaming to YouTube. I have it set up so it automatically streams to Facebook at the same time. Once you get things automated and ready to go, it's pretty awesome, you guys. It's just the beginning is a lot of setup. That, that's the only real difference. As your muse says, OBS has a big learning curve, but it really is a good program worth learning. It's not hard though. Yeah, I, I understand how looking at this stuff with OBS, and I'm showing you guys right now, it does feel overwhelming and it will take time. However, people who are teachers in the chat, tell me right now, I don't think the situation is going to go back to 100% in-person learning anytime soon. So I do think that a lot of the stuff you are having to learn right now, it is a lot of work, but I do think it's an investment. And some of you guys, I will tell you, when we do get back to in-person learning, I would be shocked if you didn't use these tools in some capacity at some point in the future. There's no way you could learn all this stuff and have it not benefit you as an educator. And so trust me, I feel you. I mean, it's a lot of work to have to learn this stuff, but I've done the research and I think this compared to say those clunky Zoom calls where students are playing Animal Crossing and everybody's video is lagging. It's like this software is made for this purpose. It's not made for anything else. And by the way, those of you who are teachers in the chat, tell me if this is your first time coming to a live stream and how did you like typing questions in the chat, me answering them, us having a back and forth? Like, what was that experience like? Because actually one problem that I really had when I first started teaching online on YouTube, and this makes me feel like such a moron admitting this, I never watched YouTube. I was like, 
I'm just going to make videos and put them on YouTube. And I did not think it was important for me to ever watch YouTube because I never do. <laughs> like I'm always watching Sherlock BBC and stuff like that because, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> so <laughs> I did not watch YouTube for a long time. But then I started watching YouTube because actually my brother told me to. And you know what I started doing is I started analyzing my own watching habits. And I started watching other people's live streams and noticing what were my behaviors? What was I doing? How was I responding? And so I'd like all of you teachers right now to do that with me. Take a step back. Think about, is this the first live stream I've ever been to? What was it like coming to this live stream? Did I like the live chat? Did I like the interaction? What was that like? And how is this different? than those Zoom calls where everybody's on video staring at each other and then needing to take a nap afterwards. Tell me from your observation here what that was like, because I think that's an important thing that a lot of people are not talking about so much. We have some questions. Sarah is saying, do the pictures of the websites that are embedded in OBS include links to those websites automatically? It does not. However, if you guys go down to the video description, you will notice that I put all types of links and information in the video description. So I do that a lot. So actually, let's do that right now <laughs> because what I usually will say to people is I'll say, here is the website, artprof.org, and you guys wanna come over here and you wanna click on teaching and learning art online. And I'll say, there's a video there that's called five tips for teaching studio art online. Here's one about mistakes. And so basically what you do is you show people the visual of the content you want them to go to. So they have a picture and then you say the link is in the video description and then they can go there and get it. So that's the best thing to do because of course it does not make sense to show a website and not give them the link. But if it's in the video description, then everybody can get it or wherever group chat you guys are putting things in. Sally says, are your closed captions created in YouTube or OBS? O uh, YouTube does it. OBS does not do closed captions. And I know YouTube, I don't know exactly how it works, but it's like automated or something. So it's not perfect, but it can be useful. Colleen is saying, how do students access this? Do they need to download OBS or just go to YouTube? Not a silly question. Oh my goodness. So much of this is so confusing, guys. And I've been doing it for so long that I, I leave out things that are very important. So thank you for asking. Students, just go to YouTube. That's it. You are the only one who has to do OBS. You're the only one who has to hook up YouTube to OBS. You just say, here's the channel link. And then say, the stream is at 12. Go to the channel. It will pop up. So for your students, it's a no brainer. And you know something else? Here's another secret <laughs> for us old farts who are teaching all these classes and high school students and college students, you guys can back me up on this. They're on YouTube all day, you guys. Like I surveyed a bunch of my high school students, how many hours a day are you guys on YouTube? And I think most of them, the minimum was three hours. And I was like, wow, that's a lot. And I said, when are you guys watching it? They're like, no, I just have it on. I was like, what? Or do you like listening to a podcast? They're like, no, it's just on. It's, it's sort of like having a playlist. And I have playlists where I listen to music and sometimes the podcast. And I'm like, so you just have it on. They're like, yeah, I have two monitors. One has YouTube, one has the work I'm doing. And I just listen to it. I had no idea how much students listen and watch YouTube. The other thing is they all have it on their phones. The YouTube app is way better than anything else you guys are going to be able to make because you're not going to be able to make it. I mean, I'll tell you, we have artprof.org, but 95% of our audience knows us through YouTube. And so I am actually advising to teachers, guys, don't bother with a custom website. Your students are not going to use it. You're much better off having a Discord server, which I talked to you guys about earlier having an accompanying YouTube channel. These custom websites, no one's gonna look at them, no matter how awesome or fabulous they are. And it made me sad, I have to admit, as somebody who runs the whole show here in terms of ArtProf, I mean, we spend a lot of time building ArtProf.org and I still think it's important, but sometimes it makes me sad when I'm like, oh my God, I put so much work into this customized website only for people to say, yeah, I just watch YouTube. So that is definitely the case. 
Uh, Don Sees World says, our college will remain mostly online for the next academic year for sure. So can see the investment here will pay off. And also guys, the other nice thing too is that it's only June. And so that's one of the reasons I decided to do the stream now because you really do have a good chunk of time before your classes get started. I know this last spring, it was so abrupt and nobody had time to sit back and process anything. If anything, I think for a lot of people, the spring was really about just being tossed into this emergency situation. Nobody had time to gather themselves, but now we have had time. We have had experience. We have seen, wow, that really did not go well. And wow, that really did go well. So it's, I think, a good time for you guys to step back and reevaluate what equipment is worth buying, what software is worth learning, and what is going to streamline the process. Because you don't want to spread yourself too thin. Like, as your muse is saying, streaming is way easier than editing everything, that's for sure. And I am a testimonial to that, guys. Because you know something? I give a lot of lectures around the Boston area, helping artists with marketing and social media and how to sell their artwork and stuff. And for a while, I would actually have somebody come with me to those in-person lectures and I'd have them record it. And I'd say, oh yes, I will at some point go back and edit that footage so I can put that lecture online. You know what? Never happened. It takes too long because like even such a simple video, like me giving a lecture, with simple visuals took too long in my mind to bother. And so you know what I ended up doing is I actually ended up pitching all that old footage, which hurts because it took time to get that footage. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna stream these online. And they got online so much faster. Like if we had waited to edit that footage for my lectures, these are lectures I gave in the fall, they still would not be online. And I'll tell you from the moment that I decided I'm just gonna stream it to actually happening, it was like a week. So it's really, really worth it, you guys, to stream instead of trying to do the pre recorded stuff. Annie is saying so having these capabilities set up ahead of time will enable me to focus on the lessons and students. That's what I mean. It's like the thing is, all that time you would have spent in iMovie or Premiere, cutting and changing voiceovers, spend it here. I mean, like this lecture has been going on for like an hour and 40 minutes. To me, this feels very close to hanging out with you guys in the classroom. And I think most of us are used to doing demos and talking at the same time. And so it's actually not ridiculous to say live is actually really close. Like I know why people don't want to do live. I get it. I totally get it because it is nerve wracking. I was nervous before I started this stream because I'm about to talk to all these people. Granted, I do have more subscribers than most of you guys, but still I understand and sympathize why live streaming might be scary. But the thing is, it's so much closer than a Zoom call. The Zoom calls are not good guys. They, they have not done well. All I heard was constant complaining from students and they didn't want to tell you guys, those of you who are teachers, because they were afraid about their grades. They told me because like I have students that I have from other places that I'm not at the same school as anymore. Yeah, let's see what else people are saying. Sorry, I'm so behind on these comments, my goodness. I am gonna try to get to all these because I've gotten through all of the um, tech stuff. So I think what I'm gonna do now for the next little bit, I'm gonna try to answer as many questions as possible to get through all of this. Okay, so let's see. Karen is saying window capture is handy for sharing a presentation. Yeah, so if you have a PowerPoint from a long time ago, you just window capture, it's awesome. And let's see, um, hmm. what is your opinion of Instagram Live, says Randy. Instagram Live can be really good if you have no visuals. So if I just wanna talk to you guys, Instagram Live is great. We did do Instagram Live for a long time at Art Prof, but we just found that it's really hard because you have to have a phone. It's not stable. Like I cannot stream Instagram Live from a webcam. I cannot do OBS. So if you wanna just do like a talking head video and you're just answering questions, that's really easy. And Instagram Live is like no setup. It's like tap live, tap go live, boom, you're done. 
So if you want to just like host like a little chat party like that, that's fine, but that's all you can do. The only other option, if you want to have different visuals on Instagram Live, you can obviously point your phone to whatever you want. But again, it's like the phone is so shaky. It's just, it's really hard. So I don't think Instagram Live is great. The other thing is that Instagram Live videos do disappear after 24 hours, unless you save them to your highlights. And on Instagram, it's not so easy to find things. Like on YouTube, if I say to you guys, oh, I want you guys to go find this video, I can say to you, oh, it's in the teaching art playlist. You'll find it in a heartbeat. On Instagram, you may not find it so fast. So YouTube is like, it's more work, but you can do more and things are ultimately a lot more streamlined. Let's see. Yep, seems like a lot of people here are saying this is a lot easier than a Zoom chat. Yeah, actually, I'd be very curious. <laughs> Tell me, you guys, what are some of the things you've been doing? Like, have you been like eating Skittles? Have you been texting somebody? Have you been eating chicken? Like, what are the silly things that you could do. I know some of you are not wearing a bra, you know, types of, tell me what are those things you've been doing right now that you felt you could not do in a Zoom call because everybody had to be on video. I mean, it, it's a really, really different mindset when you take everybody off video. Yeah, Anita says, this is so much better than Zoom. We had so much to learn so fast. So Zoom was the easiest to get on board fast. It is for sure. But I think now that we have time, we can think about it more. A Frez says it makes you feel connected when you mention questions and answer. And yep, Brittany is saying, I always have YouTube or a podcast on. <laughs> Rebecca, you're 38 and you're on YouTube all day. See, you're two years under 40 though. So to me, you are still younger than us old farts. <laughs> Felicia says, when you're teaching, do you call on students individually? Does it bother you that you can't hear them or see their work during the live YouTube lecture? Okay, that's actually a really, really good question, Felicia, and I'm really glad you brought that up. So here's the thing. One thing I really, truly think we cannot replicate at all with any success, no close, is a student drawing and us watching them draw and commenting on what to change as they draw, okay? Because I've heard a lot of different solutions, okay? One person said to me, well, why don't you have the students shoot a video of themselves while they're drawing and you can watch it? And I also had people say, well, oh, and actually this happened. I did hear about one teacher who had all the students on Zoom and the students had to connect their Zoom cameras and face the cameras onto their hands so they could draw during the Zoom call and the teacher would watch the video of their moving drawing hands and comment on their drawing technique. There are so many problems with that, guys. Okay, first of all, the students I know who were in that class hated it. They were livid, actually. They said, this is the biggest waste of time. I'm not getting anything out of this. I have to set up my camera in this weird way. They're not even seeing what I'm doing accurately because the camera angle is weird and they can't see. It's like the version that the faculty was seeing of the students physically drawing was so inaccurate that it's like nothing the faculty said was gonna be useful. And so here's my solution to that, okay? Instead of talking to them as they physically draw, okay? Ask the students, say, okay, let's say you do a drawing that is a one hour long drawing. Every 15 minutes, take a photo of the drawing. So that way you have four stages of development for the same drawing. And then you can go back and say, hey, look, early on in this drawing, I can see we're building the highlights really well, but I'm noticing later in the drawing, you sort of lost that a little bit. Like to me, I would much rather see good, accurate photographs of multiple stages of the same drawing. I feel I could really say something about that. I really would have important things I could comment on. But if I'm watching like a shaky camera with bad lighting at a strange angle of my student's moving hand drawing a portrait on Zoom, I don't think I would really have anything to say to that student. So I would say, Felicia, to answer your question, it does not bother me that I can't hear them or see their work during the live YouTube lecture because you know, I can't do it on Zoom anyway. <laughs> so you just can't. 
And so it sort of goes back, like I'll show you guys um, what I was, maybe some of you weren't here when I was talking about this, but one of the really fun things I think about streaming online is that I do have students who are drawing along with me. This is what I'm getting. Like on Instagram, people will tag me and say, I watched you live and I drew this. Like to me, this is much better evidence that somebody was there and paying attention than some shaky, crummy video of them drawing and me trying to talk to them. Like that's such a waste of time, in my opinion. And I know the students were furious. They, they were really mad. They said, you know, if he had just turned off Zoom and let us just draw the way we wanted to draw and we sent him photos better, it would have been a more productive experience. Okay. Daisy says, I'm enjoying live stream and chat, but as soon as I'm typing, thinking of what I want to say, I'm missing what you're saying. So I have fear of missing out. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think what I would tell you though, Daisy, is that we have a pretty big following here. Like we have over 60,000 subscribers. Chances are when you guys are streaming for your students, you're not going to have that many people watching. Right now, I can tell you guys there are 78 people watching live. That is a lot. That's why there's so many comments and I'm jumping around so much. But picture this, if you are a new teacher, I mean, new to YouTube, that is. If you're new on YouTube, you don't have a lot of subscribers and it's mostly just your students and you've got a class of like 20, you will not have a problem with that. It's a problem here because we have a big following. That's the issue. And actually a lot of times for our live streams, we have so many comments that I actually have a moderator who picks the comments out for me because it moves too fast. So that is more an issue that is specific to art prof. It's not going to be a problem for you guys. Let's see. We got another question. Sorry, I think I'm missing a couple of these. Oh, wow. You, you guys are doing some fun stuff here. Someone's painting their nails. <laughs> Gordo says, how about art demo music? If you want to play music for your audience, well, I mean, you can put it on a track in that video, like in OBS, you can import that or you can import an audio file. You can totally do that. But I'll tell you, people think the art demo music's pretty dippy. I don't recommend it. Like, like really you guys, just make this like you're in a classroom. Like I did the same thing. Like when I started Art Prof, I did not do live streams. I edited everything and I thought that was the way it was gonna be. But when I started making a really good connection with the audience was through the live streams. When I just did studio videos, I did not have such a tight connection with the audience. And that's what you guys want. I think that's what a lot of us who are used to brick and mortar classrooms, what has been so, I think, heartbreaking for a lot of us is losing that personal connection and really feeling that we're just mechanically producing this content and we don't get that laugh from a student. We don't crack the silly joke. We don't have them smirking us. You know, we don't get those little interactions. And I feel like this is the closest we're going to get. It's not going to be in a pre-recorded video. I can tell you that. Uh, let's see. Daisy says, compared to Zoom, 100 times better. No one's talking over. So much easier to focus. I know where to look, what to pay attention to. How to Mac stuff says, is there a way to use your phone to record while attaching it to a computer? You know what? I think if you want to record something, um, record use your phone while attaching it to a computer. I think I'm not quite understanding your question. Are you asking if you want to screen record your laptop? In which case, I would just use Camtasia. Camtasia is screen recording software that you can get. A lot of school systems have it. Uh, let's see. What else is going on here? Yep. Sally says, feeling more relaxed. Don't have to worry about my facial expression. Got Discord. You guys got to join us in Discord. This best Discord on the planet is Art Prof. And all the cool kids hang out there. So anyway, <laughs> Annie has had a very productive lecture. I have eaten lunch, brushed my teeth, washed my face, cleaned the kitchen. Awesome. I'm so glad I can help you do that. And Josh says, I've been listening with headphones, walking around to get water, going back to my screen. When an audio cue interests me to look at something... And Brittany is eating, painting, cleaning, no makeup, no nice hair. Awesome. Fabulous. <laughs> Alice is saying, I think a real fear about teaching online is that after all this over, a lot of bloopers from teachers will go online forever. You know what, guys? Who cares? <laughs> Those of you who are over the age of 40, please confirm. Don't you think one of the best parts about getting older is you just don't care about a million things? Like, I'm so over my neck. I'm so over 
all of that stuff. It's like, whatever. <laughs> Colleen is saying, if you students draw along with you, what's the best way for students to show their work to the entire class? Asynchronous discussion board. Yep, so what you can do, go to Discord, and actually I can show you guys what Discord looks like because you know what, it's right here. So why not? Let me show you guys Discord. So this is the Art Prof Discord. And there are tons and tons of channels in here that you guys can look at. Like if you want to have a just general channel just for people to hang out in. And actually teachers, this will help you guys. I did not think this was smart in the beginning, but it is the best move we ever made on this Discord channel. If you set up a Discord channel, okay? You know how a lot of these chat forms, they turn into these like dumping grounds of just crap because somebody's got to post their cat video fine. I have nothing against cats. This is what you do. You know what you do? We have a channel called self-promotion. So this is where everybody gets to dump their stuff. We say, you know what? You want to self-promote your Instagram? You want to show us your website? Put it here. Okay. Stay out of the other stuff because there's always somebody who's like, want to show you. And you're like, oh, come on. This channel is supposed to be talking about printmaking, right? The other thing you do, look at we got a meme channel. <laughs> so I just love this because it's all these like silly things that are pretty funny. I mean, I love this one. This is one that Mark Steer made. He's one of our staff artists. So this is me and Jordan in here. So we have two channels that are specifically made to just dump whatever. And it keeps the other channels nice and clean because we have other channels that are really specific. Like this one is about contemporary art. We have this one, which is just about books. We have this 2,500 drawing challenge that a lot of people are doing right now. And so the people who are doing this challenge are in this channel. And so this is a really, really great option because otherwise, if you guys don't do that, you end up with, places where it, it, again, it just is like a dumping ground of whatever, which is really not that fun, guys. So I don't recommend it. Okay, let's see. Sarah says suggestions for taking attendance via live stream. Well, one thing I would definitely do, Sarah, is I would get all the students to give you what their usernames are, because their usernames are not going to be the same as their real life names. And so if you know that Jane Doe is actually Hello Kitty 81, then you know a little bit better. The other thing about a live stream too is that when it replays, you can scroll back and look at the stream. So like everything you guys have typed during this stream, I can go back and I can find it. So I can see, okay, Alice DB, you were here at 147. Sarah, you were here at 149. I have all of that information after the video has posted. Okay, so yeah. Colleen, to continue your question, you post the photos in the Discord and then everybody can comment. And it's great. I mean, we do that at ArtProf. Like actually, I think one of my last live drawing streams, we actually have a channel here, which is called Post Live Streams. And this is where I'm gonna be hanging out in a little bit. But so basically if I scroll back up really high, the last live drawing stream that I did right after the stream, everybody came in, we all posted our stuff. And it was really fun because everybody gets to see immediately what everybody else was doing. Because I just found that when people were uploading stuff to like Google Drive and stuff, the students were not seeing each other's stuff. And it was a little bit depressing because the students complained to me, they said, I really didn't feel like I saw a lot of what the other students were making. And so look at this. I think I finally found it. Okay. So if you guys look at the stream, so this is somebody that drew along. This is somebody that drew along. Here's another person. This is all the same image we were all drawing from. It was so cool to like come in here and see people's stuff. Okay. Wow. Sorry. I know there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to get to them. I really am guys. Okay. <laughs> Afraz says, I've been on Twitter for 10 years. It was used for so much negative interaction. I've communicated with my students that way for a decade. They're used to it. I engage with them 24 seven. Good, that's great. I mean, I will tell you from my experience, my students really are not on Twitter. I have it, but I don't really use it for students. I have found that Instagram and Discord tends to be better. I mean, things change definitely. And if you have that system, it's working great for you, go ahead. 
but I have just found that Discord and Instagram are really great. Daisy is saying, is there a way to set your live stream so that only your students can see it? Yes, there is. So let me come in here. I'll show you guys. So if I'm in YouTube, this is what I mentioned earlier about being the live dashboard. Okay, so this is a live dashboard. And I come in here. And so here's where like you can change the thumbnail. You can add like this is where I was telling you guys before, like all the links, like these are all links to the equipment that I talked about. I oftentimes put in links for related videos. So all of those pieces of information that you want to share with your students, you can put it all in here in advance. And then you can do things like you can change the category, but this is where you can change it. Does everybody see this? This says public, unlisted, and private. Okay. So if you make it unlisted, only people that have this link here, the share link, can actually go to that video. Now, I have not done an unlisted stream before and send it to people because all my streams are public. So you'd have to actually play with that and see exactly how it works because I've never actually done it before. But you guys can see there are privacy settings here for a reason. It's not just for fun. <laughs> like you definitely can make it like that. And you can also make videos private for particular emails because unlisted, if you don't know what unlisted is, it basically means there's a URL that's made for that video. It does not show up in searches and only people that have that one URL can watch it. But the thing is you can give that URL to anybody. So if you want it totally private, you got to individually add people's emails and then only those people can access. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we could do a whole stream about privacy settings. There's like a million things that you can talk about for that. Let's see. Uh, Daisy says, how do you handle poor photos of drawings by students who may not have their own good tech? You know something, I actually have been working on getting a video going for that because I've had a lot of people ask me about it. But basically, let me show you these two pages that we have here in ArtProf. So this one is about photographing artwork. And even though this video does not show an actual demonstration, what it does do is show you examples. And I think that actually is extremely helpful because like, look at this. This is two photos of the exact same architectural model. One is shot by professional on the left, then on the right is shot by student. And I think students oftentimes, they don't really see the difference and how much better or how much worse <laughs> things can be if you don't take time to do it. So for example, what we do have down here is we show common mistakes. So this is a common mistake. People put it on the floor and it's at an angle and it doesn't look good. This is a common mistake when people lean over their photo and there is a big shadow that blocks the photo. Uh, we talk about getting rid of these edges, poor brightness, not cropping, having too much exposure. So I would say at the very least, Daisy, you could send your students this page just to show them, look, here are problems that you guys wanna try to avoid and sometimes that can go a long way. We do have plans to make a video. I just haven't had time because there's just so many other things that people need help with. Maureen is saying, which OBS source function allows you to show you with a live website? I think you're saying what I'm doing now, you'd have to do window capture. So basically, let me show you guys. So if you go into OBS, so if I wanna do window capture, I do this and select that. And so it's giving me all these options. Like if I want to show you guys this, I could put that in OBS like that. And so now I can click through. It, it's a little confusing because I, I'm, I'm showing you OBS through another streaming software. So it's like really wonky and weird, but just select window capture and that will take care of it. And how to make stuff says, is there a way to talk to Alex Rowe? I'm getting into acrylic paint. I'd like some more information. Yep. So if you guys go to artprof.org and you go on purchase a critique, we do have Skype calls. So if you guys want to, for example, schedule a Skype call or a chat, you can watch examples here and you can schedule them with any of the artprof staff. So if you want to speak to Jordan for 30 minutes, we have rates for that. You want to speak to Deep D for an hour, we have rates for that. So yeah, we can definitely help you guys out there. 
Let's see. Asner Muse says, I can't figure out Discord. Keeps asking me to confirm it's me. I have no idea how to do that. I don't know. I would look it up on Google. I'm pretty sure you can find answers to that. And yeah, cool. Well, it seems like Rebecca's missing cracking dumb jokes in class. Yeah, <laughs> I miss that too. I mean, I love teaching, but that part of it, I think for a lot of us has been very hard, like missing those personal relationships that you develop. But anyway, guys, I really hope that, um, you know, things settle down for all of us, because obviously this has um, been a very complicated situation. And I think the learning curve is pretty high. It's, it's pretty difficult, I think, for a lot of people with what's going on. But I can tell you that we are available here and we stream almost every single night here on YouTube. So if you guys have questions and maybe we're not live, you guys can always just um, comment on social media. We're around, we're in Discord. I'm in Discord several times a day. So if you guys wanna hang out with me there, this is a good place. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible. We run entirely on donations and you guys keep the lights on. Teachers, everybody feel free to get in touch. Join us, like I said, in the Discord. I'm happy to help because if I can save you guys a lot of the grief that I've been going through over the past five years, I'm gonna do it because we're all in this together. Thank you guys. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. Bye.